Hello, everyone. Welcome to the June 29th edition of the Chaos Community Weekly Hangout slash meeting slash whatever. Um, we're glad you're here. Look at all you. I'm so happy to see you. Uh, drop the minutes again in the chat just in case if you would like to add your name to the list, that would be fantastic. Um, just a reminder, you do not absolutely not have to turn your camera on. We don't care. So leave it off if you want. You can still participate um, by chat or through video or through audio if you would like to unmute yourself or use the raise hand emoji. That works also. Um, and I am Elizabeth, the community manager. I realize I don't usually introduce myself, which is kind of confusing if you've never seen a meeting before. So I'm the community manager. I'm Elizabeth. Um, great to see everybody. So let's jump right in. The first item on our agenda is that we have a brand new evolution metric that's been released. Matthew Tift is not on the call, but we're going to give him a little shout out for uh, a big shout out actually for doing the PR for this. That's his first PR with chaos. And we're really, really happy. Um, this was kind of his, his, um, I think he started this idea for a metric. So um, if you want to, you don't have to do it right now, but in your spare time, if you want to check that out, feel free to do so. Um, comments are obviously welcome. And this will be, it's part of our continuous release. So um, it will also be included in the official release in September, October, whenever the next one is, October, I guess. Um, but yeah, so take a look at that. It's a, it's a great metric, contribution, attribution. So it's making sure that people get credit um, where credit is due. Uh, any questions about that? I don't know if we have people from the evolution group Sean, you're here. You are on that. Yeah, page. I mean that's that's really been a Matthew's done a tremendous job, really walking us through the understanding of, of what they do, and how to how to actually um, work with the 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 way that they've defined contribution attribution. It's significantly more um, sophisticated, and it has a uh, human judgment and sort of peer review in the middle. So that's really how it significantly differs from just counting commits, issues, comments, things like that. Um, it, it also enables the crediting of things like conference participation or organizing a podcast so that, you know, your contributions to a project, whether they can be seen easily in a, in a repository or a discussion board or not, you can get credit. And, and I think, I think it's a really, helpful forward looking metric for for open source. Yeah, it was a very interesting metric for sure. So definitely go take a look at that offer your comments. Because um, I think it applies to, uh, you know, a lot of um, a lot of things. So if you're in other working groups, your voice is absolutely welcome. We love that. Any other questions or comments on this metric? And to be clear, is this are we releasing this for the 30 day review period pre release or has it been under review for 30 days? Uh, no, it hasn't been under review at all. So it's brand new. Okay, so this is so so the process if Kevin's on the phone, I believe is this is then released for 30 days. So there should be an issue open for it. Right. And I, I missed the evolution meeting because of transit. So when this actually was finished. So um, but then it should be so you have, there's like 30 days, there should be an issue in the evolution repo. If there's not, I'll make sure there is by the end of the day. Okay. Yeah, there is. Okay. Then so the process for new metrics Thank is you. the, when we create the metric, it has a disclaimer at the top where it says, here's an issue to provide feedback. And the all metrics stay in this state, even after 30 days until the release. But we have 30 days before the release where we stop releasing new metrics. And that's where we really do a push for feedback. So in essence, this will be open from now until September, whatever date um, we decide. And then, then 30 days from that day, it will be open still, and then it will be closed. Right. So. You got a while, is what we're saying. <laughs> you don't have to look at it today, but um, you have a while. So there's a question about the metric. Um, I was looking at the suggested implementation and it was one of them was 
an open PR with GitLab to be able to have contributors select how they associate their time or work on this project between volunteer sponsor or not attributed. Um, that's only that's only for GitLab. Is there? I was wondering if there's other recommendation in terms of how to get data if it's unable to come from these kinds of source code repositories in, in terms of, let's say, a survey or meetups or things like that in terms of how else you would find this from just if that data isn't available in, in the rest of it. The, the, way, the way that Drupal's done it is they built an app that, that uh, integrates with the version, system, version control system that they use. So it's sort of a part of their flow for integrating um, pull requests and addressing issues. And it can also be used for granting other kinds of credit. And there's actually an open issue uh, on GitLab because Drupal is moving to GitLab to uh, integrate this functionality as part of the GitLab platform. And there's been a good deal of discussion on it. And the, the link is in the uh, evolution minutes notes, but you know, I think if it's integrated into GitLab at some point, then that, that would be a case where uh, now you have a, a major league Git platform that's that's taking up recognition for these kinds of contributions, but but until then the implementation uh, is it will require some kind of app uh, that Drupal has right now, and they're working on they need to sustain it, so they're working out how to do that with GitLab, I believe. Cool. Thanks. Sure. <clears throat> Any other is a podcast episode coming out about this? If we haven't already released it, it's going to be, it's worthwhile listening to. I'll look up when it's scheduled real quick. One sec. Um, July 16. So look forward to an amazing episode with Matthew and Tim who is the CTO, I believe, at the Drupal Association. Oh, awesome, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's move on. My face is getting brighter and I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but I'm, I'm glowing now at this point, so. Apologies, I'll try to fix that. So it's kind of annoying, I know. Uh, anyway, sorry. Okay, so it the next- It matches your personality, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that everyone would quite agree with that, but thank you, Georg, I appreciate that. Uh, I, yeah, I won't say it, Never mind. <laughs> okay, um, so in the, in the discussions about the contribution attribution, um, uh, there was quite a lot of discussion around data ethics and the considerations therein. As such, we were thinking that maybe this would be a good idea to add to our metrics template uh, moving forward is this idea of a data ethics disclaimer. I copied and pasted this, um, what we're saying in the contribution attribution metric, but it's just something to kind of think about. We wanted to get the feel from the community, how they feel about that. Um, just so that we're keeping that issue top of mind whenever we create any kind of metrics, like how can this data be abused essentially? <laughs> and like, what would the considerations be um, that we want our the people using this metric to keep in mind as well? So what do we think about adding that as a section to the, to the template? I mean, I, <clears throat> I like the idea and I like the spirit of it, but rather than like, I, I hear, I see the word intent. Uh, maybe this is, should be more of a guidance, right? I mean, because unfortunately these things happen. I mean, people use metrics to stack rank organizations and people. We, it's to this day, it still happens. Like maybe this should just be rather than the disclaimer, just like this is a suggestion, like please do not use this to individual rank people. Or, I mean, that's a kind of a crude way of saying it, but that's what happens, right? The, That's my only comment. I mean, I, I like the spirit of this, but. Um, that's a good point. That's a really great point, Ray. Uh, and I don't know what the community feels about um, 
putting in a standard template or, or creating one for each metric. Um, but some kind of guidance, I think, is, is like Ray said, um, would be a good idea. I know we had, we had started talking about it when we were sending out the DEI badging um, guidance, because that also was in relation to collecting sensitive information about other people. And we were discussing, I think it, it culminated with us creating our own uh, public statement around how we handle data. Um, but I, I, do, I do agree that we need something a little bit more general that could apply to all the different contexts in which we are suggesting data is being collected. Um, this is not a way to like absolve ourselves from responsibility, but to call attention to it. Um, I don't know if it, if one statement is enough. We might need something that would embed itself in multiple in the templates or across the metrics that we think are more or less sensitive. Because um, I, I would like to, even just looking at it, I don't think that every metric is as sensitive as others. I think some are definitely more. I think something like this attribution metric does involve collecting personal information. So that would be, say, something that is of higher consideration for something like data misuse. Um, I agree. The more, the more I'm talking about it, the more I, I do think something is necessary and might, might take a bit more thought in terms of how we implement it throughout our metrics documentation. So I, uh, I agree with uh, Sophia at I think the, the metrics are going to be different. So the, the way I was kind of thinking about this was perhaps a, an optional data ethics header in the template. Right? So the, the header would be optional. It doesn't necessarily have to be included in all of the metrics, but it would be a it's a it's a point where we could actually reflect on are there data ethics concerns for this metric that we're releasing. Uh, we, we, am, I, am I right that I, we do have a general data ethics statement posted somewhere, right? We don't have one for users of our metrics. We have a small blurb saying, hey, you want to be mindful of, right. of this, but we, we haven't really detailed what this entails and what the challenges are. What we created, as Sophia pointed out, is how we as Petruch, uh, we as Chaos, manage our data and what our policy is um but we we have not provided guidance to the users of our metrics and those yeah. who come to us for help setting up their own policy mm -hmm. I, I, I was just writing in the chat i think we can we can start with maybe some blog posts around some of these issues just to start verbalizing them and then we can pull them together as a page on our website and then we can turn this blurb into a link saying hey be mindful of data ethics okay i, I was asking because I, I i think i heard sophia say or something along the lines of really have different metrics have different what i would call risk profiles related to personally identifiable information and i, I think the general template advice I might give, which I think echoes what Kevin and Sophia and Ray said, is that you know where where we do see you know a data ethics risk, that that would be a you know that somewhere in the template perhaps we advise that you know if there's personally identifiable information that is required to calculate this metric, and it could be available, you know, in some way, then that the risk profile for that metric, anytime there's information about people used to calculate it then then there's a risk if it's only about artifacts there's less of a risk um so i don't know if we want to say that or not but that's kind of what i thought i heard so um I, i'm hearing like two big things here at least that i i really agree with is that we need a um we need a, a something in the metric that we that we recommend that people use to talk about the ethics considerations of that metric and the other thing i really like is the um having a, some kind of statement on how we how, how we recommend metrics in general be used maybe for focus areas or maybe for all of chaos mm -hmm. that we uh, that we, we 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 have both of those and we can use the overall document to kind of guide how we write it into the metric or something like that i don't know mm -hmm. I think it should be part of the template and uh, 
I think it needs to, if it's part of the template though, it does, it needs to be a little vague. So we, we don't want to. Uh, but it's it's like, uh, instead of the word optional, which we use on some headings, I think that uh, this sec, you know, this section's recommended metrics that use in, information about individuals uh, to be calculated um, and have a potential risk of Triggering, triggering individual and legal concerns of their privacy. Or but um, we, we want to. We, we don't want to just say optional. We want to tell them why it's. We want to tell people that are new why in the template it's optional. Well, we also have more considerations than just the the person identifiable information when it comes to ethics. There's more involved there. But that could be a starting point. Yeah, I think. yeah. I mean, I think the the place where I've seen people get in the most trouble is there. But Sophia looks like she may have some specific comments. Well, I was also just thinking about um, it does kind of open the door to a a very long discussion and a lot of content. If we do want to have something more general, as Garrick was saying, in terms of say a blog post or something that kind of enumerated what these risks and considerations would be or could be. Um, I do I do generally like the idea of having it something general in the template. I think we could also have the general blurb and then maybe a specific that would be for metrics release, say specifically what elements of this metric are more or less sensitive and why. If we do that, we might need to have more of a, a is the a project framework we can borrow off of NIST in terms of say ranking level of risk associated with these, this kind of data. Um, I think we can borrow from NIST again. Why not create our own? We don't have to, because um, I think that could, even if we have the blurb in there, the special the context could be, this is low risk because of it doesn't contain any of the following or something like yeah. that. So we always, maybe we can have it always in the template, but then there's some element that connects sort of the, the level of consideration or risk. Um, in regards to more of a general statement, if we do want to do something like that, Georg, um, Daniel and I and another colleague from Google had a presentation that we gave at MozFest that was discussing all of the, some of, not all of the, some of the ethical challenges associated with this kind of data. So I'm happy to contribute that, at least what we put together for that as a starting point. I mean, it doesn't have to be this, the central piece of it at all. It's just, I have some pre-existing work there that was built with two members of chaos. So I, I feel like we can, we can leverage it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to work on that with, with any interested party. You, yeah, maybe if, if you have that, if you could forward that, it would be amazing. Uh, and then maybe we can turn that into a blog post just as a way to frame, frame this. And then as we get feedback, turn this into a more permanent document somewhere on the website. Yeah, yeah it's, it's in the deck right now, which is not ideal for a blog post, but we can fix that. I do think we oh. need to be careful about uh, some of the terminology we're using here as well. I, I like the way that Sophia was talking about it uh, with risk and, and data ethics considerations. And I'm, I'm not a fan of the, the gamification term because uh, it, it kind of means some different things. Uh, I know it's, it's often thrown out as kind of a negative, uh, but there, there are positives associated with uh, uh, gamifying systems as well. So, which we don't need to talk about. I'm just, I'm just saying, we should probably avoid that term. <laughs> I think this is awesome. And I think that it makes me feel better about giving open source maintainers who are not experts in surveys and personally identifiable, identifiable information, um, a, a little better handle on how to do this the right way. So I think that that's fantastic, especially some of those DEI metrics uh, ask very sensitive things. And it's a little bit frightening to think of just, you know, someone who's just an open source maintainer who's trying to make their community better, um, maybe rolling that out in not the best way. So I think it's awesome. This is a great idea. Uh, Sophia, I put an action item for you in the minutes just to bring that information together that you were talking about from your talk. So if you're wondering who put that in there, it was me. <laughs> Voluntold. Um, any final comments on this before we move on?
regarding well, go ahead Kevin. Uh, regarding the uh, uh, adding the uh, data ethics header to the template uh, I think we should move forward with that uh, uh, regardless of, of further conversation or what would be or or what uh, information we could provide under that that header for guidance I think uh, I think adding that optional data ethics header is a, a good first step. Does anyone have objections to that of us uh, at least putting that in as a, as a start? Uh, okay, who wants to do that? I can, I can take that action item. Uh, we've been we've been looking at other possible uh, additions to the metrics template as part of the the release process. So I I'll take that on as uh, as part of that. Awesome, thank you, Kevin. And I see Ritik put in the chat that they're also um, putting in a PR for rules around putting images in those metrics. So it will be a little more standard so that when the process is automated, everything will run smoothly. So thank you, Ritik. Oh, he, he's still on the call. OK, awesome. Was there anything else to add to that? If so, put it in the chat and we will, because he's having mic issues. So we will let everyone know. But thank you for doing that. Um, OK, so let's move on, because um, we have a couple other things. The next one is Chaos Con. Hooray, hooray. We have a site now that is up. So that is awesome. The link is in the minutes. September 30th from 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific time. So that's going to be a little challenging for some of you, sadly. But uh, not much we can do about that because we don't really have a whole lot of control. So um, yes, that is happening. CFP is open. Call for proposals is open, as well as sponsorship opportunities. So if you know people who would be interested in speaking at the conference or sponsoring conference, you can um, see the information is posted in the minutes. Does anyone have questions about that? Not that we have answers yet, because it's still a uh, work in progress, but uh, if you do have questions, please feel free to ask them. Are we still having a... Uh... Chaos Con meeting following this uh, this meeting. I think we should. Okay. Yeah, Georg is nodding. So yeah. I guess the one other thing that I would say that's not immediately visible from the site is that right now in the agenda we are proposing doing lightning talks from each working group. Um, just so folks on this call were thinking about submitting that as an RFP. I just wanted to mention. We are thinking about that already um, outside of just the submission process. So feel free to do it if you have something specific you want to share. Um, but note that we will be making some time for the working groups anyway. So don't feel like you need to. Good point. Thank you, Sophia. All right. Uh, we are going to move on then in the agenda. If you have questions anytime, drop them in the chat. Or, or pop them in Slack too. You can do that as well. Somebody will answer. Um, the next item is Zoom channel security. Um, we did have a little issue <laughs> with the office hours. Uh, we had some some jokers come into the office hours on Monday. You're kidding. Um, no. Uh, so poor poor Vinod had to had to handle that. Um, I will say that. Uh, just in, just for the record, from now on, um, I will be logging in as Chaos Community to give admin rights and host privileges to whoever is hosting those office hours so that they can take the steps needed to handle it. And if you don't want to handle it, if that's something that you're just not comfortable with, you just call me and I will bring my uh, inner Karen will come out and I will take care of the, the issue. So, <laughs> so feel free to just ping me and I can help you. Um, Vinod, is there anything you want to add to that? I'm assuming yes. you can add on this. Yes. So one more thing is like the moment you provided me the right as a host uh, rights, and you left after 40 minutes, Zoom closed the channel because nobody was there, and I was waiting for it, uh, like anyone to join, and nobody. And then when I rejoined it, I, I lost the host rights. So it should be looked on that way also. 
like Zoom uh, close the meeting after 40 minutes of just one person or two person uh, staying in the meeting and having an idea. So wait, you're saying Zoom closed your meeting? Yes. So uh, after 40 minutes of inactivity, Zoom closes the meeting automatically. So maybe something in the settings you can look for if there is any option to extend the timings in that regard. If there's no activity, that I've, I've encountered that before as well. And yes, uh, I have not. That's weird. Okay. Yeah. So like when you gave me the host right, I was there. I was doing my own work, but exactly after 14 minutes, Zoom closed the channel, and I have to re-log in. When I re-logged in, like uh, then I lost the host privileges in that scenario. Okay. How uh, do we want to handle that? Because um, okay, jo Derek is saying send a chat message after 13 minutes, just like. Yep. something in there so there's some activity exactly what i do to beat the system is send chat sometimes i share my screen okay i was not aware of that so i we can document that so that will be helpful for others who are doing it so that yeah one more uh i was discussing the same thing with kevin too and uh this issue arise like kevin uh, shared this thought that like uh, when the channel is ideal, anybody can join the channel when it is not in being used and they can use it for any illegal activity or anything. So how we keep <laughs> our channel secure? Like we have this on the website and it is open at any point in time, like anybody can join at any point in time and they do certain activity, we are not aware of it. And so how do we keep our Zoom channel, like your Zoom channel secure? if it is not being used during the meetings. If we keep our, um, our, our host settings on, on check, why don't we just use a waiting room? Um, it's pretty easy to admit everybody to a meeting if it's time for a meeting, something like that. I, yeah. The reason we haven't activated that before is because Zoom bombing hasn't been an issue and it's it always requires someone to log in. So we can't just have this room open for the community. Yes. So like, uh, this happened this time and this was a like example for us and to think of the Zoom security now. Yeah, I, I think if you have someone Zoom bombing and you have the admin rights, then activating the, the waiting room is a good way to do it. Yeah. But so far, it's happened once since we had Zoom. So I hope it's a one. So well, the question is like, in our absence, since we are not having meetings, that this channel can be used by anyone because it is open at any point in time. How do we know that is not being misused? That is the question. Or how we handle that situation if something. I don't have a super. I don't have a super great suggestion because if we lock it down and make it more secure, it makes it harder to use at meeting time. Like if somebody doesn't have admin rights and is running the meeting, which is the whole reason that we opened our own account. <laughs> so I think we have to make sure that every every working group coordinator has the authentication necessary to open the meeting and be the administrator if we want to do things like waiting rooms. So we just have to more widely distribute the credentials. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's well, that would be necessary to add things like waiting rooms. Because otherwise, if, if somebody who isn't able to log in as chaos tries to start the meeting, it won't start. And everybody will be in the waiting room forever, which is the problem we had when we were using the Nebraska Omaha account. And that's why we opened our own. So in the interest of time, um, this is a great problem. Uh, not a great problem, a great uh, thing to bring up. <laughs> it's not a great problem, but um, I really appreciate you all bringing this up. 
Um, and it's, it seems like it's going to be a little tricky. Maybe we can delve into the Zoom settings a little deeper and just see what our options are in addition to the waiting room or in, instead of a waiting room. Um, but let's, let's think on that. Uh, if anyone has any other ideas, we should um, talk about this absolutely next week. Um, so I think that's a really great thing to bring up. So thank you for bringing that up, Vanad and Kevin. If it's, if it's not a reoccurring problem, then we, we probably don't want to overreact. Uh, I would ask, uh, should, we, should we report the, the users that, uh, uh, is there a process by which we can report those users that uh, were in that call? So they, they did make some uh, uh, aggressive and, and homophobic comments towards Vinod. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I will look and see. I don't know if we have the record. Do we have access to the records? We weren't recording it or anything. So I don't know that we will even have access to the chats. To I guess chat must be saved somewhere on the cloud. I'm not sure, but I took the screenshot of the chat. Zoom, Zoom would know who they who they were. They would be able to tell. Okay. Okay. Um, let's the, the Vinod, you can you and I can maybe sync up on this okay. offline, and uh, we'll see what what our what you know our options are if we have any um, to report them and, and have them blocked from us. I guess right. if some as long as someone's logged in as admin, you can kick them out. Yes. Uh, and, and okay. That was, so. I took an action item to um, look at the security options for the Zoom channel. I'll connect with you offline as well, Elizabeth. And okay. See what we can figure out to get this figured out. <laughs> and I would just suggest that if we're not able to find a setting that we can control, that we just more widely distribute the credentials so that others who need to be admin or you know need to be the owner of the call can be, so they can kick people out, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I like that idea better of just giving the whoever's hosting will get the password. Um, and that way you can not have that problem of getting kicked out or getting, you know, logged out and they can't get get back in all of that. It's, yeah. So as long as we're cool with that, I think if you're hosting the office hours, then you have earned the right <laughs> the chaos community. Yeah, in. <laughs> you that way. Like our goal is not to make that job harder for you, uh, but easier for you to do what you need to do. So Sophia, you can look for that um, from me. So we can sync offline about that as well. Make sure you get that. Uh, okay, thank you everybody. Vinod, I'm so sorry that, that you had to deal with that. Uh, that really, really sucks. Um, it's fine, you help me out. So I, I messaged you and you were there right then and there. So that was perfect. <laughs> I'm just sad they left as soon as I came in. Like that makes me sad because I, yeah. You Mom to Elizabeth to wanted to have a moment. chat. Yeah. Okay, um, but we'll get that fixed for next time. So thank you. Okay, um, we've tabled, it looks like the next two items till the later meeting since we only have a little bit of time left to talk about uh, chaos con planning. I think then that was it. Um, thank you, whoever marked that table to late to later meeting. Um, appreciate that. Appreciate you prioritizing them in such a way for us to give us a little time for ChaosCon. Everyone else, you are free to go. I think we're at the end of the meeting. Um, thank you for everybody for participating. Great conversations today. We really appreciate you being here, and we will see you next week. ChaosCon people, please stay on for a few more minutes after this. So. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.